everyone, it's Greg from Edinburgh Renaissance Fencing Academy here with the next video in our series on Rodolfo Capoferro's Italian rapier system from the early 1600s. Today's video will be slightly different um, in that we're going to focus on the sword rather than on the fencing. Um, this is an important topic uh, which can be surprisingly complex. Um, Basically, the idea is that in order to fence as close to Capoferro's original style as possible, we should try to use uh, training swords that are similar to uh, the sword that he would have used back in the day. And that means we need to try to understand what Capoferro's sword actually was. Um, so there are a few problems with this. Uh, firstly, in the original treatise, uh, Capoferro simply describes his weapon as being a spada, which is the Italian word for sword, which is not particularly helpful from a research point of view. However, luckily his book has a lot of beautifully illustrated diagrams in it, uh, which consistently show the same design of sword being used by all of the fencers. Um, and even a quick glance at it reveals that it is, in fact, a rapier. Uh, in other words, it has a very long, narrow blade and complex hilt. And so rapier, of course, is uh, how a 17th century English language speaker would have categorised this particular design of sword. Uh, however, the word rapier uh, actually can mean a lot of different things. Uh, there's a lot of variability within the family of rapiers, if you like. Um, so you can find uh, variations in different countries and also in different periods as the rapier was in use from roughly the mid 16th through to the maybe mid 18th century. Um, so. Uh, the question is uh, what rapiers were being used in northern Italy in the early 1600s because these will be the type of swords which are correct for this Capoferro style. Okay, so uh, I'll try to summarise this as succinctly as I can. Um, I basically have looked at two sources of evidence for this. Um, firstly, uh, what Capoferro describes in his treatise, and secondly, um, what information we can get from analysing surviving uh, original swords from museum collections of databases. So firstly, the treatise. <clears throat> So the treatise, um, firstly, uh, it shows us very clearly what hilt these swords have. Um, so this is a swept hilt, uh, so they are consistently shown with uh, the uh, sweeping bars and rings, um, like this one, protecting the hand, um, with a knuckle bow as well. Uh, Capoferro's um, diagrams show a three-port or three-ring design. This particular sword has only two, um, but otherwise very similar to this. Um, so, the hilt is relatively easy to deal with and you can find many examples of that hilt surviving in museum collections. Second thing which is a bit trickier is um, <clears throat> how long should the blade be, uh, how heavy should the weapon be, what about the point of balance? Because all of these things um, tell us uh, how the sword would handle in combat. So, Capoferro actually gives us three different ways of measuring the, the ideal sword. Um, these are all rules of thumb, so they are intended to be approximate measurements. They, they won't give you necessarily a precise centimetre value. But let's go through them anyway. I uh, have some notes here to, to help me. So, um, the first rule that Capoferro describes, um, he says that the sword should be twice as long as the arm of the fencer. Uh, so, unfortunately, he doesn't tell us precisely how to take this measurement. I mean, at what point of the shoulder should you start? Should you include the hand or not? Um, but anyway, I, I measured my own arm, so from just before the shoulder joint to um, the ends of the fingers. And I got a length of 130 centimetres, approximately. 
Um, the other, or one of the other uh, rules of thumb that Campo Ferro gives us is that the sword should um, extend to just below the armpit um, from the sole of the foot. So in other words, if you balance the tip of the sword on the ground, let me demonstrate, um, the pommel of the sword should come to uh, just below the armpit. And you can see that uh, this particular sword meets that criteria. Um, again, he doesn't tell us how close to the armpit exactly it should be, so this is a very rough measurement. Um, but using a tape measure, uh, I found that the correct measurement for me should be somewhere between 125 and 130 centimeters, depending on how close to the armpit you take the measurement. So these two things from the treatise uh, give us uh, approximately the same answer. So basically about 130 centimeters total weapon length. Capoferro also gives us a third rule of thumb. He says that the sword should be as long as the passo straordinario, um, which is essentially the lunge uh, that uh, the fencer makes. This is a confusing measurement because I'm on guard in Terza Guardia, for example, and I perform uh, the equivalent of the lunge for the system. So this is my Paso Straordinario, but I don't know how uh, Capoferro intended us to take this measurement. Um, most obviously, it might be the space, the gap in between the two feet. Um, however, when I performed that calculation, I got a length of about 95 centimeters, give or take a few either side. This is significantly different from the other two measurements. Um, so my conclusion is that uh, it can't possibly refer to the space between the, the two feet, but it's not clear how to take this Passo Straordinario measurement. Um, therefore, it remains a mystery to me. But the other two measurements are quite consistent. So for me, about 130 centimetres. Now, this leads us to one other interesting point. Um, the sword is proportional to the fencer. That's very clear from Capoferro's description. So the, the correct length of sword depends on your own physique. That's an interesting point. Now, um, if we compare all of this information to what we can find in museum collections and their databases and their catalogues, or if you're lucky enough to be able to visit uh, a museum and handle some original weapons, as I have done, um, then uh, we can find some very interesting things indeed. So having performed this sort of analysis, I've taken as many examples as I could find of rapiers which uh, were labelled as originating in Italy or probably originating in Italy and that dated from the first half of the 17th century. Uh, so I performed a bunch of calculations on a spreadsheet and I came up with these average measurements. So average total weapon length 127 centimeters. Average blade length measured from the cross, 109 centimeters. Uh, average point of balance, 13 centimeters in front of the cross. And average weight, approximately 1.3 kilograms. So, um, First thing to note is that uh, these swords are uh, very long, quite heavy, and they are tip heavy in the balance. Um, secondly, these measurements actually match very closely the rule of thumb measurements from Capoferro's treatise uh, at 127 centimeters average length for a historical sword. It is only three centimeters less than uh, my personal measurements based on the treatise of 130 centimeters. Um, so that's close enough to match in my view.
Um, we should also remember that I am probably very slightly taller than an average Italian man of the early 1600s. So that could also account for the roughly one inch difference between my measurements and the historical source. So there you go. Um, that is Capoferro's sword. If you want to uh, train as accurately as possible within the Capoferro system, try to find a sword which is as close as possible to these measurements. And I'll just insert a, a table here to summarize them. Um, the final note I'd like to say is, uh, of course, you could, in theory, practice Capoferro's rapier style with any rapier type sword. Um, but just bear in mind that it won't necessarily give you uh, exactly the right feeling for how uh, the master himself intended the, syst uh, the system to operate. And in particular, be aware that many modern produced training swords, especially off-the-shelf models are uh, a little bit too light, um, often a little bit too short, and they usually have the point of balance a little bit too close to the cross. Um, also, there tends to be a very strong preference amongst the modern fencing community to favour a uh, solid uh, cup hilt or shell hilt style guards, um, which provide more hand protection um, but these actually date from a later period than Capoferro's treatise. Uh, so in my view, they're, they're not completely accurate for the practice of the system. Um, I want to just add a, a brief extra note at this point, though, which is uh, Capoferro's treatise was actually reprinted in several editions throughout the 1600s and was translated into other languages. Um, I believe there was a German language edition and probably a French language edition as well. Um, so make of that what you will. <clears throat> you could argue that late 17th century rapiers, uh, German style rapiers, French style rapiers and so on, uh, were all being used to some extent to practice the system. But Capoferro was operating in northern Italy in the early 1600s. If you want to fence in his style, choose a training weapon that's closest to his sword. Okay, so uh, that's it for today. I uh, hope you find that interesting and I hope it gives you a little bit of help when it comes to choosing your own training sword if you wish to practice the Capoferro style. Um, I will return shortly with the next video in our series. Until then, take care everyone. See you next time.